A medida que avanzamos en la comprensión de su funcionamiento, podremos desarrollar nuevos tratamientos para sus enfermedades, como el Alzheimer, el Parkinson o el ictus, y crear nuevas tecnologías que nos ayuden a diagnosticarlas, tratarlas y curarlas mejor y más rápido. El cerebro se encuentra en el objetivo de iniciativas de gran envergadura, como la lanzada por Barack Obama en Estados Unidos, o la de la Comisión Europea, que junto al grafeno tiene como segunda flagship acelerar nuestra comprensión del cerebro humano. Eta gaur, gizakion burmuñaren funtzionamendua obeki ezagutzeko aukera, eskeniko digu Nils Birbaumer, doktoreak. Birbaumer, doktorearen kurrikuluma benetan arregarria da. Txekian jaioa, bienan bizida eta bertako unibertsitatean lortu zuen doktoratua. El doctor Birbaumer es doctorado en Psicología Biológica, Historia del Arte y Estadística. Ha sido y es profesor de diferentes universidades en Alemania, Austria, Italia, Italia España o Estados Unidos. Autor de más de 600 publicaciones científicas y 15 libros relacionados con sus investigaciones en prótesis neuronales, neuroimagen del aprendizaje y la emoción, Medicina del comportamiento en neurología o neurobiología del dolor crónico. Su trabajo como investigador ha sido reconocido por numerosos y prestigiosos premios, como el Leibniz Award en 1995, concedido por la Sociedad Nacional Alemana de la Ciencia, el Albert Einstein World Award of Science of the World Cultural Council, el Aristotle Prize de la Federación Europea de Asociaciones de Psicólogos en 2013 o el Eva Luis Kohler Award a la investigación de enfermedades raras el pasado año. Es, entre otros muchos cargos, director del Instituto de Psicología Médica y Neurobiología del Comportamiento en la Universidad Alemana de Tübingen, desde donde mantiene una continuada y cercana colaboración con Tecnalia en importantes proyectos de investigación relacionados con la neurorehabilitación. El doctor Birbaumer va a realizar su charla en inglés, por lo que si alguno desea utilizar la traducción simultánea, les recuerdo que el canal 1 es en castellano y el 3 si lo quieren utilizar en euskera. Et ahora bai, Nils Birbaumer, doctor Eakduitza. Kaikso, eh, eskerik asko etortxeagatik. Thanks for coming. Mis amigos de Tecnalia me han recomendado que no hable en español, porque sería un terrible dolor para sus oídos y su sentido de la estética lingüística. A de su excusa uh, en mi inglés, pero con la demanda puedo no estar en, uh, en español. Uh, ¿Puedo tener la primera slide? Uh, I just want to give you, uh, because you're not from neuroscience, a background of some of the ideas uh, we developed uh, with Technalia in the translation of basic neuroscience ideas and how these ideas may be translated into severe neurological disease. So basically what you see here, uh, the basic idea behind all of this is that we use the brain, what is coming out of the brain activity, electrical, metabolic activity, whatever, whatever generates the brain, to use this activity and to use this activity to drive peripheral devices, robots or machinery, or, or you send the own activity back to the person. And by that, you train a person to change the brain activity. In, and I give you some, some examples of the direction, which of course not all of them, but the directions where this idea goes. So the basic idea is the same. You use the brain activity. You take it out from the brain with different means, and then you use it for machinery, for different type of applications. Okay. So what you see here is a monkey 
And this monkey cannot move his hand. His hands are paralyzed. So what he does in order to grab the food, which is vital for the monkey, what he does, I think, I know monkeys pretty well, and so he thinks, I want the food. That's what we all would think. So that thought, that thought comes from 32 cells of his brain. And so we take the 32, oops, we take the 32, we take the 32 cells and he sinks the activity and by sinking it, he moves the artificial arm and then he moves back the food. So it's just his thoughts who move this arm. So that's one of the ideas which Ander then will illustrate in stroke and the robotic people will illustrate you. Uh, for other type of robotic applications. So basically what you do, this is an old dream of mankind, that you use your own thoughts as a way of driving external devices and machinery. That's what you're doing in daily life also, because when you go, when you walk, when you talk, of course, it's your brain who does it. I mean, it's you, and your brain is you. Okay, so I give you some examples. So one example here is uh, spinal cord lesion. You know that in... in, in in particular in stem cell research, the progress is very slow. So there's not much progress in helping these paralyzed people to move. And one way is, that's exactly what I said before, here is a lesion, this makes the person paralyzed. You take the thoughts, the intention, I want to move. You take these intentions directly from the brain, put it on a computer or on a robotic device and then a prosthetic device. So the patient thinks, I move. The cellular activity is recorded and then the robot is moving him according to his thoughts. So that's a very simple idea and Anda will give you a, a very nice ac uh, example in stroke. Now the other way, this is an epileptic, sorry for the Italian, this is an epileptic patient. So one third of all epileptic patients in Spain and everywhere in the, in, the, in the industrialized world cannot be treated with pharmacon and they cannot be treated with surgery. So these people are helpless. They will have their seizures, some of them 20 seizures a day, which of course ruins your brain if you have so many seizures. So these are basically incurable people. You cannot do anything with them. So one idea which of course, it's, it's a typical application. We look at the seizure. This is a typical epileptic seizure, okay? But before the seizure starts, a seizure is always a hyperactivity. It's an explosion of the brain. So what we do here, we train people to perceive an incoming seizure. So they, like they listen to their own brain. Of course, you cannot feel this, but you, you develop a sensitivity for that seizures. And then we train them to produce a brain response which blocks the seizure. So this is purely non-invasive, doesn't need surgery, doesn't need anything. And the way we do this, the patient is just looking at the computer screen, he looks at the computer screen and we tell him, or we don't even have to tell him, we tell him, make this, make this green. And green means that his brain activity is producing an inhibitory activity. So it blocks the seizure. You cannot feel this. You cannot, you cannot feel your thoughts. If I ask you, do you feel your thoughts? Well, you feel your thoughts, but you don't feel the electricity who is producing these thoughts. So you have to learn, like driving a bicycle, like running. You have to learn like a skill, like sports. You have to learn to produce this brain activity. And when you do this, and they look at this, and when they do this, and then after about six seconds, they get a reward. The computer says, good, do it again, do it again, do it again. It's like, like learning a sport, like learning a bicycle. And after, you need a lot, you need 40 hours, hundreds of hours. Like learning a language, like learning a new language, you need a lot of time to do this. At the end, you can block your seizure. Okay, that's another example. And an example from daily life, these are hyperactive children, same thing. As you know, we have a huge problem in Europe, not only in Europe. We have a problem, we have many problems. 
but, but one of the problems we have are our children. So this, you know, we have about 3 to 5 percent, you know, these estimations, of course, are very vague. We have a lot of children, let's say that way, who have problems with attention, who cannot concentrate, May, mainly boys. But now the, the girls coming along, don't worry. In a few years, the girls will have the same problem. So these people, are, these children are treated with a drug, which a drug which is a drug which usually, when you're adult, makes you dependent. It's Ritalin. It's a drug, it's a stimulating drug. It's what our uh, puberty children use in discotheques. And that's what we give to these children. These drugs are very effective. They, if you take, if you, you can try, the old one, not, I'm too old for it, but you can try, you can try amphetamine and you will immediately notice how good you are, how attentive you are. So this drug is working, there's no doubt that the drug is working. But it is a terrible drug. We have to face the fact. So the way we overcome that problem is exactly the same. As I told you, the, kid, the problem of the kids are here in the frontal lobe. That's where your, attention, where your attention is generated. And so we train these kids to produce a brain activity, the contrary of the epileptic children. So they learn to increase the activity of that part of the brain. And again, they're trained and trained. They're trained in the laboratory in the industry, and they're trained at home. You have to do it at home also. And after a while, they can control this, and by that, and then you go with them to school, you train it in school, and after a while, they can activate this brain activity, and then it will be, uh, there will be a, a reduction of the attentional problem. Okay. Now, finally, the last example for this training type of procedure is something which we all encounter, and many of the problems we have, which cost us a lot of money, are, of course, not medical problems in a sense, but they are behavioral problems, like hyperactivity. And one of the problems we looked at for a while was criminality. People who are committing crimes, and they commit them over and over again. And you put them in the prison, they get out of prison, they do it again. And many, we know exactly the characteristics of these people. We know how they function, and we know why they commit this crime over and over again, and we know the brain areas where this behavior is originated. So we know why people are constantly doing the same thing, but they know that it has no effect, and that it's terrible, and that it has terrible consequences on the victim. Okay, again, i show you this as an example. I go, don't go into detail of this. So we train these people, in a, in, a, in, a, in a magnetic resonance machine. We train them, we just tell them, increase red. You may have to imagine you're lying there, and we say, increase red. You don't know what to do. After a while, this becomes more red. And that means that the brain areas, the brain areas which are responsible for your lack of fear, for your lack of remorse, for your repetitive criminal behavior, that these brain areas are reactivated. And you train them over and over again until they reactivate these empty brain areas. And I'll show you how this looks like in a criminal. So these, these are the brains of you, or most of you, I hope. <laughs> okay? These are the normal healthy people. And down here, oopsie, and down here, and down here, here, you see the criminals. And this is a, a situation where they, are, where they should be anxious. It's a, it's a, it's a bad situation. Okay? And you can see there is no activity in this brain. There is no activity here. This is where you, learn, where you learn what's good and bad for you and for others. And you can see there's no activity here. You see how empty this is. So when you look at this the first time, you say, oh my God. You know, how can this ever be changed? Well... I wouldn't talk to you if it wouldn't. You can change it. And that's exactly what we do. Now, I'm not saying that we're getting everybody out of prison. But, you see, this is a, such a criminal. These, are all, these were all murderers, German murderers. I don't think they're very different from the Spanish ones or the Basque ones. But, and they all have this problem that they, don't, that they don't anticipate the negative consequences of what they do. They have no fear, zero fear. And this is an, an area of the brain which is producing fear. 
And they look, they look at the computer, again, they look at the computer, and then we tell them, increase the activity in this area. And you know, like bicycling, you have to try, you have to try. After half an hour, after two hours, this is after three hours, the area of the brain is reactivated. And in that moment, they say, oh, I feel something bad. Something is happening here. So the, the change in the brain activity is helping these people to experience fear in a situation where they usually have no fear. And if they do this, that's the basis of our social behavior. I don't kill, I don't know, somebody I don't like. You know, there are many people you don't like around. Why you don't kill them? You would love to kill them. The reason why you don't kill them, because you know you will end up in prison, you will lose a position, blah, 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 blah. So it's fear which drives our adaptation. It's fear and it's the reward of participating in society. And that's missing here. And that's missing here. That's why they do it over and over again. I'm not talking about the successful psychopaths, because they are very often, we find them where we are. But they're successful. They're more intelligent than these people who are in prison. OK, I don't go into detail. So they train them. They need a lot of time. But after 10, 11 hours of training, they can reactivate this brain area. And when they reactivate it, and you bring them in a fearful situation in a social environment, they have fear. And they don't do what they usually do. Now, whether this is enough to, get <laughs> to be sure that these people are without relapse, we don't know. These people are still in prison, don't worry. They, are lifelong, they have lifelong sentences. So we did this in the prison. We don't know what is happening outside the prison. And we have to test that. Uh, and, and then I can tell you. But it's, a, it's an interesting example, because usually we think, in technology, but also in, we think that this is a behavior which is difficult to change. It's not difficult to change. It's not difficult. And we very often think this is inborn. We think this is genetically. These people are genetically driven out of their family history. It's not. They may be, but it doesn't matter. You can train them. A rehabilitation, a rehabilitation device can change them. OK, now I come to the, this is aggression, goes down. So in the prison, they get very nice after this training. I hope also outside the prison. OK, now let me get you to a final example, which then uh, goes to, uh, to the robotic application. This is an interesting example. It's not very frequent, but it's very costly. This is a disease, one of the many neurological degenerative disease. It's called amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. So it's uh, in, in Spaniolo, la sclerosis amyotrophica lateral, no? Uh, it's about, in Spain, we don't know exactly the numbers, but there are about 20,000 people who have it, but there may be more. We don't, know. we don't have exact numbers anywhere in the world. At the end of this disease, which destroys all your motor nerves, all your movements, so you're completely paralyzed. You can do nothing. You have to be respirated artificially. You have to be fed artificially. But your brain is perfectly working. There's no problem. So you can think, you feel, anything as you did before. So this is the end state, and all of you know Stephen Hawking. Stephen Hawking is a lucky, is a lucky man, because he never arrived at that state, and he will not. He has a form of the disease where he can still move a little bit of his finger, or a little bit of this, and with this he can drive the computer, which is of course easy. These people cannot drive anything. They are completely paralyzed. The eyes are paralyzed. They are completely locked in. They, you, they can not, they cannot send any information outside their brain, but they're completely normal. So this is a terrible state, as you can imagine. How you get, how you can do, what you can do with this. And now I come to the Technalia Corporation. So at the beginning, we looked at people, this is the first letter ever written by the brain of this patient. But as you can see this patient, this patient is still moving the eyes. He has glasses. So he's not at the end stage of the disease. OK, so we train him. Same thing as I told you before. It's always the same thing. It's like sports. You train him with a computer device, which is so-called brain-computer interface. Interfaccia tra il cerebro e la macchina. E con questo, with this interface, they learn to produce a certain brain activity. 
so a saw, a certain saw, a certain image. And if they have learned that, then they can produce this image with their brain. I collect that image, and then they see, a, like on the next slide, you see, the, then they see a letter strings here, you see these letter strings? Then he can think, oh, I want to select the age. Then he syncs the thought, and the computer automatically uh, splits this letter string into half. If the age is still in there, he has to do it again, and again, and again. And at the end, the letter is on the screen. So he can do this by just thinking. Okay, and then he can select, uh, he writes a letter. Here you see his brain activity. He produces this brain change, and with that brain change, he selects a letter. And then he can write. It's slow. It's very slow right now, but it works. But, 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 you have to take, I'm still in time? Okay, but I'm done in a second. Now here you see a patient. Then we went further. We went to these patients, like this patient. This is a patient of Ander. This patient we communicate with. And then he slipped into the completely paralysis. So we could not stop that. So he was completely paralyzed and then we said, okay, let's try again. Select a letter with your brain. Select a letter with your soul. He couldn't do it. There was nothing. And then we said, we said, well, this is a technical problem. Of course, we are from Technalia in some way, so we always think about technical problems. It wasn't a technical problem. It was a psychological problem. So we, did, we said, well, we have to solve the technical problem. So we implant the electrodes in the brain. So we opened up his brain. We have great neurosurgeons like you have here. You actually, the better neurosurgeons are here in San Sebastian. So we opened up his brain, we put the electrodes in his brain, and we tried to teach him yes and no. So he thinks yes. When he thinks yes, then a certain brain activity is checked by the computer, and then if the computer recognizes it, it says yes. So his, his thought is moving the computer. But I can show you this for hours, for days, for weeks. At the end, nothing. It's a, it's a disaster, you know, there was no real response, there was no real, we could never figure out what the guy really wanted, and obviously he wanted it. So, so technology is not always the answer, it's often the answer, but it's not often the answer. Why is this so? Now we know, now we have, after 10 years of stuff, we know why. Imagine, imagine you in bed, you're completely paralyzed, and, and, and you think, ah, I would like that somebody turns me around. You can think that. Nobody knows that you think that. Nobody will turn you around. Well, half an hour later, your husband or your nurse will come and turn you around, but not when you want it. And the next time you think, I want to see my mom, my mother. You can think that. Nobody knows what you think. Your mama is not coming. So what does that mean? And that goes on for weeks, weeks, months, and years. So what is the brain doing? The brain is doing what you do when you do something which has no success. You give it up. If you are a successful person and you t it turn out that you can, everything you start has no positive consequence, what are you doing? You give it up. And that's exactly what's happening. So at the end of a long process of this, the, the goal-directed thinking, I want this, I wish this is going slowly away. And, and quality of life in these people, we know now, and quality of life is high. It's increasing, very strange. You would think with the progression of a disease, quality of life is getting worse. In this type of disease, it's exactly the other way around. So in some sense, the, lo the, the loss of volition, the loss of, I want, I have to, I have to do this. Over the years, you slowly adapt, and you don't, you don't sense this as a negative or as a lack in your life. So your life quality is still okay, and that's why it's worse to find a technical solution for this problem. Because most people think it's not worse, it's because these people should die, because it's a terrible state. Not true. We know that this is not true. Quality of life is high. 
like in many people who are severely diseased. So what we do now, and I'll show you this in the movie, just to finish that up, we ask simple question on the phone, like reflexory, I say, you know. San Sebastian is the main city of Germany. Boom, you say no. Automatically, you don't have to think about that. And the no is producing a brain response, a change in blood flow. The computer takes the change in blood flow and says no. This was a no. But he has to be trained. The computer has to learn what is a no thought and what is a yes thought. And after a while, we know. And I show you a movie of a typical patient. And, and with this, uh, I'm finished with the example. So this is the system now. So we have two systems. And these are four patients. They are all completely paralyzed. They all cannot move their eyes. All their eyes are paralyzed. They are open or closed, but their eyes are not moving. So they cannot communicate anything. OK, and then here you have a so-called near-infrared spectroscopy system. This is a system which records blood flow from light. The light goes through the brain, goes through the, to the scalp, and then ends in the brain, and we can, and we can check the, the blood flow. And then we have the EEG. The EEG we use to detect slips of attention, sleep. Because if you're in bed the whole day long for years, you sleep and you get up and you wake. So your whole daily life in terms of circadian pattern is chaotic. So very often we talk to the patient, we say, do you feel OK? Or do you have pain? And there's no answer. And then we look at the EEG. And then we see that the patient is asleep. And we cannot see. If somebody is paralyzed, you cannot tell when this person is asleep. And you cannot tell when, it's, when the person is attending to what you say. And that's why communication with these people is so difficult. Because you sleep when you like and not when I like. OK, and I'll show you the movie. This is a patient. I first show you the patient. She was completely paralyzed for more than five years, so she hasn't communicated for years with her husband. This is her husband. And, and he was desperate because he wanted, he wanted to communicate with her. It was impossible. Her eyes are completely paralyzed. The eyes are normally they're closed, but we can open them, but she cannot look much. OK. And I'll show you the eyes. <clears throat> then you can see that the eyes are not moving. So I ask her something, and I say, move your eyes to the right if it's yes. Move your eyes to the left if it's, if it's no. OK? So again, you would think that she's feeling very bad. Not true. She's feeling very good. She's perfectly OK. So she's asked some questions, I give you just examples, and then, and then she has to move the eyes, but, we, but just to make sure that the eyes are not saying yes or no, because that's much easier than a, a brain-computer internet. The Rhine is a river, and you look at her eyes, there's nothing moving. Okay, now here you see now a sample of questions. Now here we ask, first we ask many questions where she knows the answer. And then we can calculate what's a yes and what's a no. Pain is good. Here is the patient, it's dark because the infrared, infrared light doesn't like uh, bright light. Okay, so she's asked. She has 25 seconds, she is very slow. She has 25 seconds time to answer yes or no with her brain. So her, she's only asked to think yes or no. And the computer checks in the brain activity whether the no appears. She says no, which is correct. OK, then we are, this is a, a German patient. You are sitting in a Porsche. You know, in Germany, everybody talks about Porsche. And we are in Stuttgart, where the Porsche is produced. So people think this is great. Actually, she doesn't. <laughs> because she's blind, she doesn't care about Porsche anymore. OK, so she says. Look at her answer. Deine Antwort wurde als Nein erkannt. Okay. And it goes on and on like that. Okay, I, I don't go in. This is, another, this is a very tragic patient. It's a very young patient. She's 23 years old. She has a special gene 
And she, within a few months, she was completely paralyzed, completely. She cannot move anything. And again, we ask her these questions. She has the knees here. The eyes are not moving. You can see that the eyes are completely paralyzed. Let's look what we ask her. Oh, it was asked, the num the, the, she asked her the, the name of her mother, and she was correct, and she said yes. Okay. Just to finish that up, do you see the, 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 the background? The background of this is always the same. And when Andra is give you the other example, it's always the same. It's the idea to use a combination of a learning strategy with a technological approach to record brain activity, and then use these two, the learning mechanism, together with the technology, and that, using this for the rehabilitation purpose. That's what we want to realize here, uh, in, here in San Sebastian. Okay, to finish it with a Jewish saying, it's in, oh, but it's also here, Basque, Ixapena, Itsugaria, Taukat. Thank you very much.